we'll start with the introduction then how we go about history examination what are the investigations that are required and then we how we approach a case of lymphadenopathy and finally there will be many case scenarios throughout the session so to keep you guys engaged so let's start so initially first we'll start with a case this case is of a 13 year old girl 13 year old girl who comes with complaints of diffuse swelling measuring about 2 into 3 cm in the of size on the left side of the face in the submandibular region in the submandibular region on the left side of face she gets this swelling so this is the chief complaint this is the chief complaint this being the chief complaint would anyone like to volunteer yes sir yeah hello rishab yes sir good evening so you this is a this is a case okay this is a chief complaint what do you like to ask in this patient of history so we'll elaborate on the swelling sir okay you'll on elaborate the onset on onset and the progression onset and progression you will like to elaborate on okay this kid started to have this swelling one week back one week back and it has slowly progressed to this stage slowly progressed to this stage okay yeah so it's an so, acute onset hmm. okay and uh, associated features like fever fever okay you need to associated features like fever was not present pain sir no fever no pain um any difficulty in swallowing okay why you want to know difficulty in swallowing so because uh, if it's a submandibular region if it's a lymph node involvement it can be any uh, oral cavity or oropharynx lesion okay it was not there no difficulty in swelling was there okay um mm. any hg of uh, weight loss no it's just acute in onset no just one week no weight loss okay mm. so any someone is asking for hg of sore throat No, okay. it's just short for Sharon. No breathing difficulty. Okay. Mm. Any other swellings elsewhere? No, this only one solitary swelling was present. Okay. Mm. Um, any significant yes. past history? Okay, very good. You come HOPI. HOPI reveals that there is one week progression. slowly progressing to this stage acute in onset with no other associated symptoms next past history does the swelling increase with eating no swelling doesn't increase with eating so past history one two weeks back two weeks back she had a dental procedure that's all dental procedure was there two weeks back okay no associated with no discharge okay okay someone is telling ranula okay differential diagnosis because submandibular region okay we can take keep one of the differential diagnosis as ranula okay hmm. anything else you would like to ask rishab um, past history was this after past history what do you like to ask a uh, family history no nothing was significant in family history personal history personal history also no family and personal history nothing was significant again okay, history of contact with a tb case okay very good you last for history of contact so any exposure history that will come back to exposure history no that was also not present okay mm. any allergic history or a drug history no so very good you asked for drug history next that is very important important no that was also not there okay uh then it's examinations yeah very good next we'll move on to examination with history can you come you okay we'll do the examination and then only come to differential diagnosis okay, okay. examination yeah local temperature someone is asking for it was not raised okay no tenderness then we'll do in no inspection palpation yeah what do what all if you had been to a swelling class no day before yesterday by dr yes, kishan so what all you yes, see for if a swelling is present uh, size sight yeah, shape yeah 
site it's already mentioned 2 into 3 site site also in the submandibular region shape it is almost round in shape you can tell surface skin over the swelling skin over the swelling was normal surrounding, surrounding skin. area was normal consistency it was soft in consistency and then in fluctuation yeah, you guys have attended the class and you guys were oral hygiene very good in the history you should ask for oral hygiene oral hygiene was good but she underwent a dental procedure dental procedure she underwent after that the oral hygiene was good she didn't have any associated infection and all okay mm. was it toss fluctuating fluctuating yeah it is fluctuating you can tell it is fluctuating okay Mm. Then uh, palpation of other lymph nodes. Other lymph nodes, yeah. It was ex not on examination, but on further going ahead and doing USG along with that. Some along with this being the most prominent lymph node, other lymph nodes as well was present. Four to five other lymph nodes were present. Okay. So with this differential diagnosis, can you think of anything in your differential diagnosis? One was ranula. So, since Lymphine the swelling is in the submandibular sir. region, is it lymph node or not is the first question. So, yeah, cold abscess yeah. you can think of. Ludwig's angina being the location. Yes, Ludwig's angina was there. Can be there. Parapharyngeal abscess. Yes, okay, abscess. You can think of. Someone is telling lymphadenitis. This also we can keep. Anything else we can think of? Okay, lymphoma, but there are no high risk features Short over history. here. There's okay. no high risk feature, so we can't think of lymphoma. So these were the on next. Would you like to do any investigation? Mm. Lymph that will account to lymphadenitis on the Ajit Kumar. Yeah, any so investigation? One more ultrasound. Huh? FNAC. Okay, you want to do FNAC. FNAC revealed follicular hyperplasia was present. That's all. Lymphoid follicular hyperplasia was present. Increased infiltration of cells were there. Okay. CBC was normal. Okay. That accounts to CBC with DLC. Nothing. Everything was normal. This can be a lymphadenitis only. So you will think of finally why you thought of lymphadenitis? So because if it would have been an abscess, you would have got a pus when you do FNAC. Yeah, and uh, ranula, okay. you would have got clear fluid. Hmm. Uh, and uh, lymphadenitis, you get hyperplasia of the lymph uh, lymphatic tissue. Yeah. Lymphoma, okay. But particular. no etiology. We are not able to find out any etiology. No. So what can you think of that time? What is the term used that time? Uh, un, uh, idiopathic reactive. whatever it is yeah, it's the case of reactive lymphadenitis but this kid on after a, after a week after a week of observation the the lymph node resolved on its own whatever lymph node was swollen no it resolved on its own so the reason okay Rishab very well participated. Yes. Thank you for participating. So the re you. reason why I we have put this case is the very minute we think of a lymph node swelling, our head is tuned to jumping into lymphoma. Directly we jump into malignancy. Correct, no? So most of the cases of lymphadenopathy is not associated with malignancy. Only around 15% is associated with malignancy. And one more thing is Rishabh directly went into FNAC. FNAC we we'll have to insert a needle and it might be a slightly costly procedure as well. And in most of the cases, lymph node biopsy or FNAC as well as not required. See, this case only after a week of observation, the gl gland dissolved on its own. So FNAC was not required in this case uh, In this case itself. To the max, we could have done a CBC and USG with history of dental procedure. We could have directly thought of reactive lymphadenitis and we could have waited for it to dissolve on its own. To the max, we could have given antibiotics antibiotics we could have given and we could have waited for it to resolve so that's why we 
should tune our mind to first look into all the benign causes and then look for any risk factors for malignancy if present okay so let's move into today's topic so starting with introduction what is lymph node these are bean shaped structures bean shaped structures found in clusters along the distribution of lymphatic channels in the body these are lymph nodes so they are basically secondary lymphoid organs as we have read in our second year and this is the structure this is the efferent this is the efferent then you we have the cortex and the medulla we have outer cortex and inner medulla inner medulla we have and these are efferent these are the efferent pathway cortex we have cortical region and paracortical region paracortical region is where usually the t cells rest cortical region is where usually the b cells rest on activation they usually form germinal center on activation this forms germinal centers correct no so this is the basic anatomy uh, and yeah medulla contains all the sinusoids efferent if efferent lymphatics arteries veins medullary cords are all present in the medulla okay so what is lymphadenopathy lymphadenopathy is nothing but enlargement of these lymph nodes enlargement of these lymph nodes we think of lymphadenopathy so there will be why this enlargement either it is because of increased proliferation of the normal lymphoid elements itself or it can be because of infiltration infiltration either by other phagocytic cells or it can be because of infiltration by malignant cells so this will account to if there is increase in lymphoid elements we can think of hyperplasia of lymph node itself like lymphadenitis if it is because of infiltration we can think of any infectious etiology or any malignant cell coming infiltrating into the gland so further this lymphadenopathy most of the times in adults or in adults we can think of it being a normal finding itself that's why we usually wait until and unless there are no red flag signs we usually wait for it to resolve we give it time around 3 weeks it might resolve on its own because it can be a normal find or it can be a normal finding as in it can be persistent for more if it's persistent like more than a year even then we can think of it being a normal finding okay it's like soft flat submandibular nodes less than 1 cm in size or palpable inguinal nodes up to 2 cm in size which when not associated with any other signs and symptoms if the patient presents then we usually tend to wait because it can be a part of normal finding if present for a very long duration or if it presents suddenly we wait for it to resolve okay so if pathological if pathological this lymphadenopathy again 84% of the time it is benign it is benign in nature of which 63% we cannot establish etiology so it is called non specific or reactive lymphadenitis remaining can be certain specific etiology will be there so only rest 16% can be associated with malignancy so let's look into the causes let's now look into the causes mainly adults or pediatric especially pediatrics we will think of infectious nature infectious etiology and this infection can be various viral bacterial fungal chlamydial parasitic rickettsial almost all the infections can go ahead and cause lymphadenopathy whether it can be generalized or localized pertaining to the drainage area of the lymph nodes but it can cause lymphadenopathy so we should almost always think of infectious cause if not infectious then we can think of lymph node involvement then we can think of immunological immunological diseases so immunological diseases almost all the immunological diseases again can present with can present with lymphadenopathy so it can be rheumatoid arthritis jia mixed connective tissue disorders sle dermatomyositis so almost serum sickness drug hypersensitivity so like this many immunological almost all immunological disorders again can present with but they'll have other systemic signs pertaining to the disease or constitutional symptoms like that can be present next finally we can think of malignant diseases finally we can think of malignant diseases which can be hematological in origin or solid organ malignancy which has and it is presenting as metastasis to the local lymph node next it can, we can think of certain other rare causes can be lipid storage disorders in case of kids endocrine diseases like hyperthyroidism due to infiltration or very other rare diseases like kesselman's disease sarcoidosis or kikuchi's disease rosai doffman syndrome kamasaki's disease again in kids 
their wherein there will be mucocutaneous involvement all these things we can think of certain rare causes so these are the causes so now we saw the introduction we saw introduction wherein we saw what lymphadenopathy is and most of the times it can be a normal finding few of the times it can be pathological and even when pathological most of the times it is benign in nature and very rarely malignant so next let's look into this you can just answer through the chat box let's look into two interesting but rare rare cases both are but they are interesting cases okay first one so please answer through your chat box 13 year old kid presented with complaint of swelling in the posterior part of the neck on the left side posterior part of the neck on the left side it was 3 into 2 cm in size and it was present since 6 months it was present since 6 months it was not progressive since the time the kid has noticed it it has not been progressive and there was no associated fever sorry there was no associated with it were signs of inflammation over the skin or no tenderness was present no other associated features were present except for fever some amount of fever and malaise was present since last one month low grade continuous fever was present okay this particular swelling again thought to be of reactive etiology they just tried to give antibiotics and tried to resolve but it did not respond it was same even on examination for more than 3 to 2 to 3 weeks it remained same next they went ahead and did usg because they thought of lymphoma hodgkins lymphoma and all as well can present with cervical lymph lymph lymphadenopathy so thinking it could have been a malignant cause they did usg but they noticed multiple lymph nodes were present multiple such lymph nodes were present the most prominent being this one okay it was present on the left side of the neck okay anterior axis sorry posterior aspect of the neck on the left side it was present so lab values revealed this there was esr was raised leukopenia was there and few atypical lymphocytes were present and this was the biopsy picture this was the biopsy picture so what can you diagnose if you can give diagnosis okay we'll think of differential diagnosis yes since this being the age this guy could have reached puberty so firstly we we'll think of and there was some amount of atypical lymphocytosis as well we can think of infectious mononucleosis or of viral other viral etiology but infectious mononucleosis again we will have what is prominent is some amount of skin rash will be there on giving antibiotics penicillin like that and kid itself will present with pharyngitis and all so okay hurry and tell it is languor and cell histiocytosis this we can keep in the end since it is, since it is malignancy we will think of this in the end okay very good scalp infection someone is telling so all these things can be dd can it be lymphoma yes we can think of lymphoma also we can think of lymphoma also but now i'll tell you what happened to this kid was after looking at this biopsy picture they came into a diagnosis and after they just left it as it search after one year the kid recovered the fever went off and the lymph node which was there as well the swelling which was there as well disappeared after one year after one year it disappeared so it was of a very benign nature now could you make diagnosis interesting because this case is mimicking lymphoma it's mimicking infectious mononucleosis it's mimicking some infectious etiology langer and cell histiocytosis yeah it's mimicking that but what is the disease now could you make out necrotic debris were present with karyorexis yeah punit and sharanya got it right very good kikuchi disease this is kikuchi disease this is kikuchi disease what is the other name for kikuchi disease anyone okay that is for you guys to find out what is the other name mainly it was diagnosed because of because of the biopsy because there were absence of neutrophils absence of neutrophils there were necrotic debris which showed karyorexis this is prominent and very importantly there were crescentric shape histiocytic infiltrates crescentric histiocytic infiltrates so this put them to diagnosis of kikuchi disease we'll look into this case we'll look into this case next case now 
a 10 year old boy came with complaints of progressive increase in the right sided neck mass again right sided neck mass was a progressive increase in the neck mass it was painless in nature see around 16 to 5 cm in size on the posterior aspect so very large very large lymph node this was a very large lymph node and multiple such smaller lymph nodes were present bilaterally so bilateral on the posterior aspect which one being very large and the other multiple other lymph nodes were present in this kid it was associated with mild grade fever night sweats and weight loss mild grade fever night sweats and weight loss becomes important and these were the lab findings and biopsy again is very prominent what can you think of now what could you guys think of okay again everyone is jumping to malignancy differential diagnosis of hodgkins can be made It's because these three symptoms together what are these three symptoms together called since this is present we can think of lymphoma we can think of tb very good we can think since s100 was positive someone sharanya told lch okay very good sharanya langwein cell histiocytosis can be there okay all these things differential diagnosis you could find but biopsy showed something very characteristic you see this is a cell this is a cell but this cell has eaten up many histiocytes this cell has eaten up many histiocytes sorry this full thing is a histiocyte this full thing is a histiocyte but this full histiocyte has eaten up other phagocytic cells which were there which are there other what is this finding called in pathology we would have read of something like this a cell eats up another cell what is this called see again over here this is a histiocyte and it has eaten up other cells over there other infiltrating cells it has eaten up what is it called in pathology yes very good hari aran it's called imperi policy so this was the characteristic finding on histology so now anyone with the diagnosis now anyone with the diagnosis again this kid also he improved on its own on his own the kid improved after an year this kid as well improved so this is a, another rare entity called as rosai dorfman syndrome both these things mimic it, mimic malignancy one being the age of presentation and how it presented but both these things were of benign nature one again both of them were diagnosed because of characteristic histology and this was immunoreactive for s100 as well so now let's move into the history history firstly based on the age what all we can think of if it's pediatric pediatric case most of the times it is infection most likely thing in pediatrics is infections so we will always think of infection as the, one of the main cause if it's congenital then the mother would have acquired any tortuous infection or syphilis and that can be the cause or any other malformation would have led to lymphatic swelling then if an infant presents again we will think of infections first then usually lipid storage disorders like neiman pick disease and gaucher's disease also rarely presents with lymphadenopathy along with hepatosplenomegaly so we can think of it or leukemia leukemia can be thought of older children then again we can think of infections kawasaki disease again in kids hodgkins lymphoma which has bimodal presentation it can present in kids as well as elder age mesenteric lymphadenitis again in kids langwein cell histiocytosis few people told just now you i thought of lch as a diagnosis cgd also can have lymphadenopathy again castleman's disease what is the etiology for castleman's disease anyone kikuchi disease and prosaid of men these were the two cases which we saw now adults we can think of usually autoimmune disorders and again infection only in case when it reaches old age then we will put malignancy as the first followed by other infections and other causes can be thought what is the cause for castleman's disease HHV eight okay one of the causes HHV eight very good so next we'll move on based on gender yes few diseases have gender predilection like 
most of the autoimmune diseases like SLE, Jogren's and all tends to be more common in female and most of these lymphomas are more common in males. Based on occupation, occupation very important, occupational history becomes important in lymphadenopathy because exposure to pets or animals by veterinary doctors or we doctors itself can get infected by because of the contacts which we'll have or radiation exposure, important farmers because of increased parasitic infection, exposure to silica, beryllium, all these things can lead to lymphadenopathy. So occupation history becomes important. Next, address again, because many of these infectious diseases are endemic. So we we'll think of if the patient is coming from certain particular place, then we can think of that as the common etiology. Because like in India, if they present with lymphadenopathy, long-standing lymphadenopathy, first thing we we'll think of is tuberculosis. Western countries, histoplasmosis, coccidioidomycosis, paracoccidioidomycosis, and many other diseases can come, tularemia, plague, all these things can be common in Western countries. Kerala, coming with inguinal lymphadenopathy and leg swelling, we can think of chylariasis. Northeast India, hepatosplenomegaly will be there. Then we can think of Kala Asar. African countries, Burkitt's lymphoma can be there. Castleman's disease can be there. All these things are prominent in African countries. So like this, there are many diseases. These were just few examples to name. Next, we'll come into HOPA, history of presenting illness. Yeah, okay. So usually in HOPA, if a younger age group comes, like a child or younger adults come, then we'll think of many benign disorders, most probably infectious. Again, first think of benign in that benign also, most probably it is infectious. If it's an elder age group, then we can think of malignancy as the cause. Then we can put malignancy ahead in our differential diagnosis, okay? So how does patient present? Patient usually presents with lump. So next, we should confirm that it's a lymph node. How do we do that? One is based on examination, two again based on history. Next, investigations will think because what, how the patient present is with the lump and case where what case this discussion of swelling was already taken. So we'll confirm it to be a lymph node. Next, we'll rule out alarming symptoms, which next, then we take a good history. Initially, we let the patient speak out his complaints, let him describe, and then we'll go to our certain focused questionnaires. So this is the mnemonic. If a patient with lymphadenopathy presents, we can ask first, let the patient describe his symptoms. Then we can ask in terms of this cold wrap tape. This is the mnemonic. So we'll ask about how is the character, how was the onset. You guys covered most of it in the first case. So you guys are aware of it already. What is the location? What is the duration? Then coming to what are the relieving factors? What are the aggravating factors? What are the respirating factors? Relieving factors like reactive lymphadenitis, it relieves. If you give NSAIDs, it can relieve the pain, relieves. Aggravating factors, which is the lymphoma that aggravates on giving alcohol, On exposure to alcohol, the pain, there'll be pain in the lymph node. Which is that? Which lymphoma will you think of? Yes, very good. Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yeah. In that way, then past treatment history, past like any radiation exposure to that area will cause lymphoma. So past treatment history becomes important. Or any drug history causing this again, treatment becomes important. Associated symptoms, we'll look into it later. Past medical history, again important. Then any emotional impact. For impact, this is the most important thing because a patient presenting with swelling, first thing that will done in his mind is again malignancy. So we'll have to, like how we tuned our mind that most of the times it is other etiology, we'll have to confront the patient as well that it is of a benign nature. So the his anxiety will also be relieved. So emotional impact, again, we'll have to relieve it. Next, epidemiological and exposure history, this also will deal with it. So from this, from this, we can frame a differential diagnosis. So differential diagnosis is based on the causes which we saw till now only. So this is the mnemonic which we found. There is one more mnemonic, simpler one, which we'll see later. Now we'll look at it in a broad way. When I'm summarizing, we'll I'll tell the small debate. So we can think of it being a congenital, any malformation or acquired infection from the mother. We can think of congenital, then most probably infection and for neoplastic cause, then endocrine, like acromegaly can present, hyperthyroidism can present. Next, metabolic, we saw that lipid storage disorders. A for allergic, allergic to any drug, 
post any blood transfusion all these things allergic reaction can take place next degenerative causes like amyloidosis also presents inflammatory or autoimmune in nature vascular like kawasaki disease and other vasculitis as well can present then idiopathic or iatrogenic idiopathic being reactive lymphadenitis and iatrogenic any drug induced all those things then it can be because of any local trauma that could have infected and go cause local lymphadenopathy or exposure to any toxic chemicals like silicon beryllium all those things as well can cause so this is how we frame a differential diagnosis based on this history and how do we ask history based on these features so with this background now can we do this case a 63 year old gentleman presented with multiple palpable lymph node on the anterior aspect of the neck so how do we do this case this case anyone would like to volunteer anyone would like to volunteer okay fine if you don't want to volunteer we can go through the chat box itself then please reply through your chat box this is the chief complaint so next after chief complaint we'll go into hopi we'll go into hopi so what can you ask in hopi how will we go about in hopi yes very good duration and onset so this has been there since 3 months this since 3 months but from past 1 month from past 1 month is noticed increase in size increase in size okay increase in size so this is the duration and onset so this is the mnemonic over here which you can follow what else you will ask location is as already mentioned in the history in the chief complaint yes someone is asking for fever that comes in associated so he has fever he has fever he has weight loss yes he has weight loss and he has night sweats also night sweats also he has aggravating the living factors okay nothing as such was found the thing as such was found and the patient was used to have fatigue he as well okay next someone is asking for exposure history exposure history nothing as such was present nothing as such was present okay contact that also comes in exposure history only tb contact was not present tb contact was not present so have we covered everything alcohol consumption no alcohol consumption also no so next comes treatment history so drug history this we should ask very good you asked for drug history no patient was on his usual anti hypertensive medication and anti hypertensive medication he was taking as inhibitors he was taking and he was on metformin also for his diabetes that's all past medical history nothing significant for this case was present would you like to ask okay associate that will become difficult the patient also had alternating diarrhea and constipation okay this also he has been having since the past 6 months but this he revealed only on asking only on asking he revealed this and he had ignored these symptoms okay avantika is thinking of differential diagnosis but ibs usually doesn't present with lymphadenopathy so no no features of thyroid involvement was present okay colon cancer okay so how will we make differential diagnosis in terms of in neoplastic in neoplastic we can put colon cancer you are thinking of metastasis of colon cancer okay but there was no hematochezia and all in this patient yes very good you asked for pell lipstein fever pell lipstein fever was not there but he has been having fever he has been having fever for more than one month he has been having fever for more than one month now okay. 
Okay, next you're thinking again in terms of lymphoma only. You're thinking of Hodgkin's lymphoma in your differential diagnosis. Okay, carcinoid someone is thinking of. Yeah, he had history of weight loss. He had history of weight loss. Palpation, palpation of swelling and abdomen. So next you're going into examination. You're going to, so we have covered all these things. With this history in mind, we can think of one is neoplastic. Other things usually doesn't fit in. We can still think of, since it is India, we can still think, still TB still fits into the differential diagnosis. TB still fits into the differential diagnosis. So yeah, leukemia, we can think of lymphoma, leukemia, and all these malignancies we can think of. Correct, no? So anything else we can think of? Endocrine cause, no infection, we have put rule out, we can, we have ruled out congenital and other things we can rule out. We have ruled out toxic, all these things we have ruled out. So infectious and neoplastic history, these are the differential diagnosis we have kept in mind. On examination, on examination, okay, Pooja, Pooja, she tells it as people's disease. We can put it over here, okay. Whipples, we can keep. On examination, what was present? It was a hard lymph node. Hard lymph node around size was around three into four centimeter in size, three into four centimeter in size. Hard lymph node around three into four centimeter in size was present. This was the examination finding. Next. What would you like to do next with this differential diagnosis? We'll go into okay, fixed. Uh, fixity was not present, Bishop. Next, we can think of investigation. So, what is the basic workup? Other groups of lymph node, no. So, yes, very good, Avantika. You asked for it whenever we find a look that. I was about to tell in history, whenever we find a localized lymphadenopathy, we should always search for other sites. We should always search for other sites to rule out generalized lymphadenopathy. Okay. So on investigation, on investigation, okay, people will do CBC. Very good. CBC revealed anemia was there. Anemia was there. Platelet counts were decreased. And lymphocyte count, there was uh, lymphocytosis was present. Uh, Leukocytosis was present, WBC count was in increased. On doing DLC, mainly it was lymphocytes which were increased. Lymphocytes which were increased. Lymphocytes which were increased. So this we could find out from the peripherals uh, from the CBC. Next, what would you like to do? Okay, we can have peripheral smear also with this. Peripheral smear also, there was lymphocytosis present along with anemia. Okay, Rishab is telling imaging modality. Imaging modality will be USG. USG revealed there was splenomegaly was there, hepatomegaly was there, and multiple other lymph nodes were also, multiple other lymph nodes was also enlarged, okay, at multiple sites. So, some general amount of generalized lymphadenopathy was present. So now next um, differential diagnosis, you people are thinking in terms of leukemia. Okay. CLL. No, serology was negative. HIV was not there. Smudge cells was not present on peripheral smear. What would you like to do? Since a lymph node is enlarged, what will you go ahead and do? Since nothing else is diagnostic, now we can think of doing biopsy. Now we can think of doing biopsy. Correct, no? So biopsy revealed, again, lymphocytosis was present. Uniform shaped, uniform shaped, lymphocytosis was present. Okay. This was the biopsy finding of the lymph node that was enlarged. Uniform shaped lymphocytosis was present. Okay. See, when it comes to diagnosing malignancy, of a lymph node will most probably directly go off into biopsy than doing but uh, than doing FNAC. Okay, but kids, you are telling. So when if we are thinking of uh, leukemia or lymphoma, after doing biopsy, what is the next?
thing you are going to do to come into diagnosis immunohistochemistry right and bone marrow since bone bone was still not at involved bone marrow was normal bone marrow examination was normal in this patient yes immunohistochemistry immunohistochemistry revealed that it was the case was cd 20 positive if it is cd 20 positive what will you think of two types of lymphoma sir there one is b cell lymphoma one is t cell lymphoma yes we we'll think of b cell lymphoma next cd 20 was positive cd 5 was positive then cd 23 was negative and cyclin d was positive cyclin d was positive now what will you think of what will you think of and for this patient underwent colonoscopy also because of his symptoms and colonoscopy revealed multiple polyps were present multiple polyps were present multiple polyps were present with this you should be able to diagnose now yes shreya very good it is mantle cell lymphoma it was a case of mantle cell lymphoma so this is how we approach a case through hcpi and examination you will get a very broad differential diagnosis then we do some amount of basic work up you will go you will go further ahead and then you will do some specific work up that is required for that particular case based on the etiology which you have in mind so again the uh, bi biopsy of the polyp also showed lymphocytic lymphocytosis so lymphomatoid polyposis is characteristic of mantle cell lymphoma with this immunohistochemistry finding we could have thought of mantle cell lymphoma so okay we should go a bit fast because still in the starting and it's almost 15 minutes okay but then we'll rule out alarming symptoms so alarming symptoms usually those that has to be promptly treated we'll think of that too. treated and diagnosed so what it will be malignancy one more is std and local infection to prevent the spread and any severe immunological disorder so if the swelling is associated with progressive increase in size of the lymph nodes then we'll think of malignancy and when it comes to malignancy there are certain red flag symptoms red flag symptoms if this is there then we can think of malignancy as one of the first differential diagnosis and go ahead directly with all the higher investigations like biopsy all those things we can directly go into so this includes we'll not wait like we'll not just do a basic work up and wait for 3 to 4 weeks to resolve we'll directly do a biopsy this includes age greater than 40 years duration of lymphadenopathy for greater than 4 to 6 weeks generalized lymphadenopathy but that doesn't mean that if it is increasing size of lymphadenopathy with this because just because a small lymph node which has been present since one or two years then we will not think of malignancy it has to be associated with increase in size and the patient has recently noticed like around 3 to 4 weeks if he has noticed and it is still present not resolved then we will think of it next male sex male gender it has not returned to baseline after 8 to 12 weeks the size of lymph node and again supraclavicular location very important because it indicates some metastasis has taken place systemic symptoms like fever night sweats weight loss associated with hepatosplenomegaly and white rash so these are the risk factors or red flag symptoms this can be asked in your exam as viva you will directly think of malignancy so what are the other alarming symptoms again lymph node described as hard will think of metastatic cancer sudden onset with pain will think of lymphadenitis of infectious etiology so that we can think treat it to prevent the spread is that will be if it has a sinus with discharging pus we'll think of suppurative lymphadenitis usually because of tb and constitutional symptoms like fever malaise weight loss we'll think of again malignancy which we have already mentioned next we'll look at the character we'll ask for the character if it is hard we'll think of it is malignant if it is soft we'll think of this is in patient's own word examination we'll look at it later benign if it is painful and tender we will think of infective etiology or inflammatory etiology rarely malignant or if it is because draining if the lymph node is draining with pus and all we can think of bacterial or mycobacterial infection typical or atypical mycobacterial infections then comes onset and duration if it is sudden onset with pain we will think of infective etiology so if it is acute in onset and if it is associated with pain like duration is around 1 to 2 weeks it is associated with pain skin shows signs of inflammation then we we'll think of infective etiology but if it is present like as mentioned in the red flag symptom over a month gradually increasing in size then we we'll think of malignancy 
So next is the associated symptoms, associated symptoms. Again, here over here, we'll ask based on the differential diagnosis, which we have kept in mind. First, it will be infection. So we'll ask symptoms related to infections, like infant coming with lethargy, growth retardation, skin rash, microcephaly, chorioretinitis. We can think of tortuous infection. Next, if it is fever, chills, sore throat, malaise, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, cough, all these infectious symptoms, constitutional symptoms pertaining to infections, then we can think of a very broad differential diagnosis of bacterial or viral pharyngitis, hepatitis, influenza, infectious mononucleosis, measles and rubella in kids, TB, initial stages of HIV as well can present like this. If this is associated with mucous membrane involvement, then we can think of secondary stage, general which will have lymphadenopathy along with mucous membrane involvement and skin rashes. Then we can think of STD if it is associated vaginal discharge or urethral discharge, ulcers, vesicles, we can think of HTD. If it is associated with insect bites, stings, cuts, or scratches, then we'll think of SC pillars, mite infection, scabies, sporotrichosis, cat scratch disease. What is the etiology for cat scratch disease? What is the organism? <clears throat> then if these flu-like symptoms are present, these above mentioned symptoms are present, then on giving penicillin, the patient develops rash. The patient develops, yes, very good. It is Bartonella hensley. Patient develops rash. Then we'll think of infectious mononucleosis. Then if there is unintentional weight loss, we can think of TB, HIV, such chronic diseases. If it is recurrent opportunistic infections are present along with chronic diarrhea, all these things, then again, we'll think of HIV. When, wherein there'll be generalized lymphadenopathy in that case. Then very important, I forgot to mention oral hygiene also. Oral hygiene we should look as for and we should look out for oral hygiene along with any ear discharge, pain, fever. Then we'll think of ear infection or oral hygiene. So we'll refer to a ENT specialist. Then if it is fever, chills, headache, abdominal pain, all these things will prompt towards typhoid etiology. So once we get to know what that it is infectious, then we can have a very broad differential diagnosis in mind and we can ask for specific history, specific symptoms like abdominal pain, headache in case of typhoid, any ear infection, TB, HIV, then we can, whichever is common in that particular place which we reside, whichever infections are endemic, then we can go ahead and ask for specific symptoms. Next, it can be because of immunological. So next differential diagnosis we have is after infection immunological. If it is associated with mucous membrane involvement, conjunctivitis, and all cervical lymphadenopathy, we think of Kawasaki's disease. If it is associated with joint pain, ulcers, rashes, all these constitutional symptoms, dry mouth, dry eyes, then we think of autoimmune disorders or vasculitis and all. If it is associated with arthralgia, arthritic area, on exposure to medication or antiserum, then we can think of serum sickness, serum sickness. If it is associated with muscle weakness and all, along with certain skin changes, we can think of dermatomyositis. Next, coming to endocrine cause, features of hypothyroidism and fatigue will indicate adrenal insufficiency. Next, if it is metabolic in nature, very rare in pediatric, they will have all these features, growth retardation, mental retardation, hepatosplenomegaly, microcephaly, all these things. Next, coming to neoplastic. Finally, neoplastic. These are the B symptoms which our case had fever, night sweats, and weight loss. Important, mainly it is lymphoma or TB brucellosis also can have these B symptoms. If there is unintentional weight loss, we should ask for, again, more common than malignancy is TB and HIV, but malignancy will become the cause. Breast lump and discharge, we can think of breast CA. Persistent cough, we are coughing up blood, hoarseness of voice and all is present. TB, first we will think of in Indian scenario, next it can be head and neck malignancy or lung cancer, all these things. If it is associated with any abdominal complaints, we think of abdominal malignancy along with weight loss and all. If it's associated with blood in urine, we think of prostatic cancer in old age. Then we can have renal or bladder tumor as well. So these are the things which we'll think of. So let's look into the next case. Let's look into the next case now. 21 year old gentleman presented with complaints of bilateral cervical lymph node swelling. So, this was the chief complaint. Next, we'll go into HOPI. Next, we'll go into HOPI. So, HOPI revealed that, revealed that he case also had 
this swelling was present since a week one week it he also had fever malaise sore throat was present arthralgia was present myalgia was present all these things were present okay this was from his history of chokki there was no, nothing significant in his past history drug history or family history or family history nothing significant was there which this in the background what all can you think of in the differential diagnosis okay one is infection one is infection most likely it is infection in among infection what do you think of tb tb so when you think of tb he should have had his long standing history and he should have had certain symptoms of weight loss night sweats all those things those things were not present so you think of yes viral etiology what is what viral etiology can you think of okay you will think of infectious mononucleosis in this stage okay very important is infectious mononucleosis next someone is telling cytomegalovirus okay very good we can think of cytomegalovirus yes it can be a normal pharyngitis also it can be a normal pharyngitis as well yes some amount of pharyngitis was present but on doing throat culture nothing came up nothing came up so we could have ruled out streptococcal pharyngitis we have ruled out so investigations when we did investigation cbc cbc revealed leukocytosis was present leukocytosis was present okay leukocytosis was present in this case so next since we suspected viral and being this age 21 or year old since sexual contact can be there infectious mononucleosis was thought of and monospot test was positive monospot test was positive oral hygiene was good in this case rishab monospot test was positive so now what do you like to have in your diagnosis since the monospot test was positive what will you think of now if monospot test is positive you will invariably think of infectious mononucleosis yes very good you thought of infectious mononucleosis but but what happened is on doing pcr for epstein barr virus it turned out to be negative so this is a part of mononucleosis like syndrome mononucleosis like syndrome so what all can be differential diagnosis now someone had mentioned cytomegalovirus so this is the most mononucleosis like syndrome is the most common presentation in cytomegalovirus in immunocompetent individuals this is the most common presentation cytomegalovirus is immuno mononucleosis like syndrome is the most common presentation and this as well presents with monospot test being positive okay so this was the case now let's look into three case scenarios this is about a 35 year old multiple sexual partners presented with inguinal lymphadenopathy okay but these are three different case scenarios in the first case scenario okay you avantika directly then jump to third one okay third one is groove sign is positive if groove sign is positive what is the diagnosis what would you think of yes very good avantika it is lymphogranuloma venera next what about these two cases first case was okay could you describe the which which is syphilis which is syphilis someone is telling donovanosis okay rishab tells first one is syphilis rishab could you tell features of syphilis features of the chancre that is present in the syphilis it is usually a this one yes painless first case presented with painless hard chancre with button like feel with button like feel with regular margin with regular margin so this we will we will thought of syphilis what is this what is the second one what is the second one now what is the second one second one was 
painful soft shanker irregular edges and on touching it there was bleed on touch there was inguinal lymphadenopathy to call it as donovanosis yes very good it is hdp and one more thing is there are two kissing ulcers are present no so again characteristic of hdp correct no so you people told donovanosis donovanosis also can have these features but donovanosis what you get is a pseudo bubo pseudo bubo it is not a natural inguinal lymphadenopathy so next after looking into the history we'll go into the past history past history past history if there is past so we looked into the history of hopi in terms of the pneumonic which we found all this pneumonic then we we'll go into the past history past history past radiation history indicating malignancy history of any connective contact with connect communicable disease like tb is important past history of tuberculosis is important because it can recur next came coming to the family history so family history again malignancy lipid story disorders all these things are associated with family so could you connect this these other two findings what can you think of now anyone with the answer lymphatic okay i'll tell this is after consuming a drug after consuming a drug drug history is there drug induced now what do you think of lymphadenopathy with this this finding was given post giving iv form now what can you think of which drug which drug is the causative etiology hydralisin okay now this is purple glove syndrome now anyone yes correct it is phenytoin 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 purple toe syndrome and purple glove syndrome bishop so next coming to the drug history drug history is very important as all these medications all these medications are associated with lymphadenopathy so this is the importance of drug or any toxic exposure next coming to the personal history personal history we should search for any epidemiological clues epidemiological clues includes exposure like exposure to cat you can think of cat scratch disease toxoplasmosis if it is undercooked meat then we can think of toxoplasmosis or yersinia all those things if it is associated with tick bite lyme disease tularemia if it is tuberculosis recent contact with tuberculosis blood transfusion or any renal transplant then you can think think of cytomegalovirus high risk behavior stds iv drug abuser endocarditis hepatitis b infection all those things occupation we have already dealt with it and this is the travel related history because of few certain diseases are endemic so the comes the travel related history so this was the personal history then again immunization status or recent immunization immunization status because we can rule out after giving the immunization so recent immunization to the malignancy features and sexual history for std so that is important so yeah we have done all the cases now next after doing a thorough history and framing a differential diagnosis we'll come to the physical examination physical examination includes general assessment of the patient if the patient looks emaciated muscle wasting is present weight loss is present will come into the differential diagnosis vitals mainly look for temperature because in infection or any lymphoma in malignancy fever can be there then coming to head to toe examination 
Paler, if present, think of all these chronic diseases like TB, HIV, leukemia, malignancy, and all leukemias mainly. Then ictus, if it can either be metastasis to liver or any primary malignancy of the liver itself. Clubbing, again, certain malignancy like bronchogenic carcinoma, lymphoma can present with lymphadenopathy and clubbing. Edema, if it is any localized edema like unilateral edema, we can think of hand edema, pancos tumor, unilateral limb edema, we can think of five hilary acids, abdominal and pelvic malignancy as well can cause edema along with this can come with mesenteric or retroperitoneal or inguinal lymphadenopathy, abdominal and pelvic malignancy can present with. And then look for signs of nutritional deficiency again to rule out malignancy and chronic disorder. So finally, we'll come to what we are supposed to do, mainly lymphatic examination. And how do we do? It is very much similar to examination of swelling. Short case of swelling was dealt, no? So very much similar to it. In terms of inspection and palpation, we do. And how do we do? And using the pulp of the singers, what we do is we do circular movements over the skin. Over the skin, we do circular movements wherever what are the fingers we use? Mainly index and middle fingers are used. But if the lymph node swelling is large, then we can use ring finger as well. So with these fingers, using the pulp of the fingers, we just do circular movements for the swelling and feel for the swelling. And when we feel, what all we look for are these things. We will look for all these things. Is the palpable mass a lymph node, first of all? Because there can be any thick muscular structure or any uh, or any other swelling that can mimic it. No? So first, we should come for confirm whether it is a lymph node or not. Next, we look at the extent, location, size, number, surface, texture, consistency, mobility, <coughs> temperature and tenderness, skin over the swelling, finally, hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. So these are the things which we will do under lymphatic examination. Initially, whether it is lymph node or not, we just try to move the structure in two directions. If it moves in both the directions, then we can Think of it being a lymph node and not any adjacent structures which are confusing. Next is the extent. So extent, why it is important is it can either be a localized lymphadenopathy or generalized lymphadenopathy. So that is why it's important if a patient presents with a single lymph node swelling, we should go ahead and look for all the other lymph nodes also which are superficially palpable because the causes become different. Causes become different. No, That's why. So when do we call it as generalized lymphadenopathy? Either it is involvement of three or more non-contiguous lymph nodes. Non-contiguous is important and three or more. Okay, three or more non-contiguous lymph nodes. So what can be the causes? These causes are already discussed. So malignancies usually other than metastasis, all these leukemias, lymphomas and all can present with generalized. Then many of the infections as mentioned can present with generalized lymphadenopathy. And again, autoimmune disorders, usually most of the autoimmune disorders as well go towards generalized lymphadenopathy and miscellaneous diseases like, like Castleman's disease, sarcoidosis, metabolic diseases, disorders, all these things also go towards generalized and iatrogenic causes like drug induced or serum sickness, all those things as well causes generalized lymphadenopathy. So when do we see localized lymphadenopathy? Localized lymphadenopathy is usually either because of drainage of the particular area tumor is there and it has drained and gone block the lymph node causing the thing lymphadenopathy or it can be because of any local infection so the local region is important wherever lymph, lymph wherever the lymph node is located we have to know the drainage of that region drainage of that region becomes important okay so coming to the location localized lymphadenopathy if it's found yeah palpate other sites to rule out generalized lymphadenopathy as already mentioned and area of drainage becomes very important. So, <clears throat> these are the three presentations. What will you think of if these are the three presentations? Okay, right supraclavicular, it is virtuous. Okay, very good. Okay, Haryaran is jump to yeah it is a gastric malignancy or any other intra abdominal malignancy can be thought of this is sister mary joseph very good and these are left axillary lymph nodes which are iris lymph nodes very good you thought of gastric malignancy so let's look into 
location, what are the particular drainage sites. So in head and neck, usually it will be occipital. If occipital, you usually go palpate behind the ear, posterior to the mastoid. Okay. Posterior to the mastoid process at the base of the skull, we go and palpate. We go and palpate. Stand ahead of the patient. Put your fingers behind the ear, posterior to the mastoid at the base of the skull. We find. So if it is occipital, then we can think of usually any scalp infection. And then comes preauricular and postauricular. Preauricular usually <clears throat> in front of the ears, just roll the fingers. Postauricular same thing behind the ears, roll the fingers. So preauricular and postauricular as well. Postauricular we usually think of scalp infection. Preauricular again drains the scalp and the skin of the surrounding areas and we'll think of scalp infections mainly again mycobacterial infections and if case of malignancy any localized skin neoplasm or parotid malignancy or any lymphomas all those things can take place next is the submandibular lymph node submandibular lymph node how do we palpate so usually the neck lymph nodes how do we palpate is what is the scheme is we go if it is the anterior group of lymph nodes we go stand behind then slowly start rolling in your, your fingers near the submental region. So we'll cover submental lymph nodes. Next, roll your fingers over the submandibular region. After that, in the anterior cervical, upper, middle, and lower. So this we do by standing behind the patient. Okay. Then we come ahead. Then we come in front of the patient. Go and roll your fingers in the posterior aspect of the neck to cover the posterior cervical lymph nodes. So that is what is given over here. That is what is given over here okay so this is how we palpate this is the how we examine and this can be the differential diagnosis this can be the differential diagnosis mainly based on the region they drink if it is posterior cervical lymph nodes it will be since the preauricular lymph nodes itself drain into posterior cervical lymph nodes it will be almost the same etiology along with again as we saw kikuchi disease rosai Dorfman, all those things usually involve the posterior cervical lymph nodes again then comes the submandibular lymph nodes usually drain the oral cavity. So any infections over there, oral cavity infections usually come into submandibular lymph nodes along with the associated malignancy, oral cavity malignancies, all those things usually present with submandibular lymphadenopathy. Again, anterior cervical lymph nodes, since they have a very large drainage area from the larynx, tongue, oropharynx and anterior neck. So any malignancies in the surrounding region as well as infection usually present with this usually present with anterior cervical lymphadenopathy okay so next coming to the supraclavicular supraclavicular lymphadenopathy is very important it's because it is one of the red flags and as we saw over here if it is a left supraclavicular lymph node we'll think of virtuous lymph node and if it is right cervical lymph node you'll left supraclavicular virtuous lymph node intra-abdominal malignancy and if it is right usually we'll think of any malignancy in the thorax presenting. So that's how it becomes important, supraclavicular lymph nodes. Next, coming to the upper limbs. Upper limbs, main is the axillary lymph nodes, axillary lymph nodes. And there are certain groups of axillary lymph nodes, like anterior axillary lymph nodes. Usually you roll the, you usually, how do we examine is, <coughs> we go stand in front of the patient, standing in front of the patient, then we keep the patient's arm slightly abducted and supported the right side of the patient we use our left hand and if since this we are we can't demonstrate it but yeah and if we are using the left side of the patient we use our right hand supported in the partially flexed and abducted position okay we examine if it is anterior group of lymph nodes usually in the anterior axillary lymph, axillary fold we examine if it is the apical lymph nodes, we go press our hand into the apex. And if it is a posterior group of lymph nodes, usually in the posterior axillary fold, then comes the uh, lateral group of lymph nodes, which are pre present in the medial aspect of the humerus. Over there, we go and examine. So this is the scheme for examining the axillary lymph nodes. And then comes epitrochlear lymph nodes. Epitrochlear lymph nodes, we examine by keeping the patient Mandulus, three centimeter below the medial mandulus, we will usually examine. And coming to the differential diagnosis, so epitrochlear lymph nodes, if we see, usually the local skin infections or local trauma can cause any lymphoma, sarcoidosis, skin malignancies, all those things can, can be thought of. If it is axillary lymph nodes, main is the 
breast it drains usually the breast area so breast cancer is the main thing which we we'll think of and various other things like cats uh, even the upper limb trauma also finally drains into axillary lymph node so any infection local infection also can cause like cats crest disease tularemia all these things cause local inoculation site will be there in from there the infection will be carried on and we'll have a lymphadenopathy in the axillary region so this is the thing next coming to the lower limbs lower limbs there are horizontal and vertical group of lymph nodes usually the horizontal group of lymph nodes can be palpated vertical groups are very deep so it cannot be palpated that easily and then comes the popliteal so horizontal group of lymph nodes it is below the inguinal ligament we feel vertical it is a bit difficult to palpate so differential diagnosis again becomes any local infection to the upper limb sorry to the lower limb and then comes if it is vertical lymph nodes then we can think of certain abdominal pelvic malignancies like prostate or we can think of any external genital malignancy like penile malignancy vulvar anal or any skin neoplasms which present with if the vertical lymph nodes are involved okay so then comes certain lymph nodes are not palpable like thoracic lymph nodes or abdominal lymph nodes if these lymph nodes are not palpable so these things can be done only by ultrasound or chest x ray examination we can find out then coming to the size coming to the size so before doing that can you solve this mcq so someone tells it is c yes very good it is c so what is important is this mcq was put for because just the size of the lymph node though we call it with the definition that significant lymphadenopathy is it needs to be of certain size just the size of the lymph node may not be of that certain significance to rule out malignancy significant lymphadenopathy yeah when we need to go further and examine and do certain investigations we can think that lymph node is swelling that lymph node swelling is significant but when we think of malignancy in our mind just the it's just not the size of the lymph node just because the lymph node size is large we cannot think of malignancy it is, has to be progressive increase in the size on serial measurements that gives much more information so just not the size but the progressive increase in size is more important so the same thing mentioned over here it's increase in size on serial measurements which is more of diagnostic value so when do we call it as significant lymphadenopathy this is again very confusing because different textbooks mention different size so from pediatric textbook significant lymphadenopathy we can call when if inguinal lymph nodes are greater than 1.5 cm in diameter and axillary lymph nodes are greater than 1 cm in diameter and epitrochlear lymph nodes of any size we can consider it to be significant and what are the other findings what are the other findings it has to be multiple sites matted lymph nodes and when the nodes are red tender or ulcerated when it is associated with the foci of infection and associated with other signs and symptoms this is very important for your viva they last what is significant lymphadenopathy definition so it has to include this and when we come to adults harrison says this when the load size is less than 1 cm square most of the times it was benign and non specific cause and <laughs> when the another study when the node size was greater than 2.25 cm square in size okay then we could have thought of any malignant or granulomatous lymphadenopathy in the head so when the size is usually greater than 1 or greater than greater than usually 2 cm we can think of it being of malignant cause that is what it indicates and epitrochlear lymph node greater than 0.5 cm in size we can think of it being significant or when we think of malignancy it has to be greater than when it is greater than 2 cm we can think in terms of malignancy but again it is just not the size but the serious serial on doing serial measurements the progressive increase in size is more important coming to the number where it can be either single or multiple if it is multiple if it is contiguous if it's involving contiguous spread like cervical lymph node contiguous spread usually we can think of hodgkin lymphoma then we have something called as shorty lymphadenopathy wherein over here there will be multiple small sized mobile discrete lymph nodes they won't be attached to each other 
discrete hard lymph nodes and this happens in case of certain viral infections that is when we call it as short lymph node then we'll look at the surface and consistency so if it is soft we can think of infection and inflammatory cause if it is firm we can think of hodgkins lymphoma if it is hard we can think of any malignancy or lymphoma stony hard usually because of metastasis stony hard with fixed lymph node we can think of metastasis if it is firm and rubbery again hodgkins lymphoma if it is fluctuant we can think of any separative cause and as mentioned before short lymph nodes we will think of any viral infections next coming to the texture it can be either discrete separate or matted when it is matted what becomes important is we can have certain few differential diagnosis like tb sarcoidosis lymphogranuloma venerum metastatic carcinoma lymphomas in our mind okay so next coming to the mobility if it is fixed again you can think of metastasis or malignancy coming to the tenderness either this tenderness can be because of stretching of the capsule as in case of inflammatory or infection and very rarely it can be because of malignancy as well because of there will be central necrosis will be there and hemorrhage into that will cause pain that will be case of malignancy next look into the superficial skin and changes in the skin so any signs of inflammation if it is present we can think of acute lymphadenitis if if it is red and glossy we can think of any red then it is initially red and glossy that means that the lymph node is tense followed by that there will be a sinus is formed and discharge will take place that time we can think of tb lymphadenitis if there is fixity of the skin we can think of secondary carcinoma if it is tense and stretched again along with dilated subcutaneous veins we can think of any lymphoma rapidly growing lymphoma if associated with hepatosplenomegaly again these are the differential diagnosis we can keep in our mind again this is very important viva question hepatosplenomegaly with lymphadenopathy what all we can think of we can think of lymphomas we can think of leukemias infectious mononucleosis tb sarcoidosis hiv histoplasmosis almost both of them have same presentation tb and histoplasmosis and metabolic disorders we can think of and after following this we do thorough systemic examination and look for any localizing signs to aid in diagnosis okay so this was about the examination so we have done history we have done examination and then following this is the investigations so what are investigations basic investigations and higher investigations which we can do in case of lymphadenopathy is what we see so first is the lab investigations we will initially do a cbc differential and peripheral smear with this again many things can be found out like any infection any leukemias any lymphomas can be made out just by doing a cbc differential and peripheral smear we know the etiology after that if there is a raised esr or cap again these are acute phase reactants that means there is underlying inflammation again any immunological disorder or infectious diseases it indicates we can take a throat swab if there is any cervical lymphadenopathy we can take a throat swab serology we can do if we are thinking of any particular infection we'll go ahead and do serology then we can do uh, since in india we can do a basic mantle text and cbnet okay after this comes the radiological investigation radiological investigation mainly will include an ultrasound x ray ct or mri and pet scan okay so what all we can detect through radiological those lymph nodes which are not superficial and still enlarged that can be detected and then to look for metastasis we can do like what are the sites of metastasis and what other lymph nodes are involved from the primary primary we can go do ct mri or a pet ct scan and to differentiate malignant from benign as well we can do so this was an ultrasound of the lymph node this was an ultrasound of the lymph node this is image a and this is image b which among them is benign which among them is malignant yes purti we measure long axis to short axis ratio that is important so which is benign yes rishab very good b is benign b is benign a is malignant so we'll see 
so usg so what is the significance of ultrasound is that so this is an art, this is taken from an article this particular paragraph what it states is for assessing cervical lymphadenopathy or any other lymphadenopathy it has a very high sensitivity like of around 95% and when this ultrasound is combined with fnac they have around as high as 93% so this is much superior to ct or mri or pet ct that is what the last set statement again states ultrasound scan has the highest sensitivity since it has the highest sensitivity this can be the basic screening investigation and it is cheap and it is not associated with any other radiation side effects since it is cheap also we can directly go ahead and do an ultrasound examination because it has the highest sensitivity for assessment of the malignancy and highest specificity is when we combine a pet scan with ct pet ct it has the highest specificity so this we can keep as a higher order investigation for final diagnosis but for basic screening purpose we can always go ahead and do ultrasound that is the importance of ultrasound and how do we assess one is based on the size long larger the lymph node more are the chances but again it is see on serial measurement if we find increase in size then we can think of increased chances of malignancy okay and based on various based on the size various cutoffs are assigned based on the size and location various cutoffs are assigned for the size to indicate benign and malignancy okay then coming to the shape as we saw over here we'll measure long axis is to short axis ratio when it is less than 2 we can think of it to be malignant that nothing means that when it is almost circular in shape we can think of it being malignant and when it is elliptical in shape we can think of it being benign so next we look at the border if it is sharp border or ill defined we think of metastasis if it is smooth border we think of benign cause we we'll look at echogenicity <coughs> if it is hypoechoic usually malignant lymph nodes are hypoechoic compared to the surrounding structure except one except one which is that anyone anyone knows the answer for this which is this it is usually papillary carcinoma of thyroid will be hypoechoic almost test everything yes it is because of the calcification papillary carcinoma of thyroid becomes hypoechoic very good dish next intranodal necrosis in case of tb and any other metastatic lymph node calcification as mentioned papillary carcinoma of thyroid metastasis from there and do doppler if there is peripheral or mixed vasculature again it indicates that there is metastatic lymph node okay next coming to the chest x ray chest x ray mainly it is done to see for hyalur lymph node so what what is the diagnosis over here anyone what sign is being shown what sign is being shown over here look at the arrow marks this this and this there is hyalur lymphadenopathy in the three regions so what sign is this yes very good garland sign in case of sarcoidosis in case of sarcoidosis so mainly chest x ray and any ct scan mri or an ultrasound of the abdomen can be used to see non superficial lymph nodes can be used to see usually non superficial lymph nodes okay so hyalur lymphadenopathy what all will be there tuberculosis histoplasmosis blastomycosis coccidioidomycosis any leukemia or lymphoma can present with hyalur lymphadenopathy hodgkins disease can present metastatic malignancy can present sarcoidosis can present this indicates that it is bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy okay this is unilateral this is unilateral so metastasis will be unilateral again ct or mri intra abdominal or retro peritoneal lymph node finally coming to fnac or excision biopsy fnac or excision biopsy so what are the indication for this we usually directly don't jump into doing biopsy we usually wait for around 3 to 4 weeks we usually wait only cert only under certain conditions we will do prompt biopsy we will do sudden immediately we will do biopsy when when do we do immediate biopsy we saw no there we saw certain red flag symptoms was there in the box when that is there we jump into doing prompt biopsy so when the history and clinical features are uh, sorry history clinical features and findings are suggestive of malignancy or if it is a solitary hard non tender cervical lymph 
not in a elderly patient with history of tobacco abuse or a supraclavicular lymph node because usually supraclavicular lymph node is associated with metastasis or solitary general lymphadenopathy which is firm and movable suggestive of lymphoma means b symptoms are present all those things then we jump into doing prompt biopsy and again since it is when we are doing a lymph node biopsy though it is a superficial structure and it can be removed by fnac but if there is a lymphoma which we are suspecting that lymphoma can just involve a part of the lymph node and or if there is infiltration by metastasis it can involve a part of the lymph node so we might miss out that's why fnac is usually reserved to thyroid nodules and for confirmation of patients in case of relapse only then we use fnac rest of the time we do we proceed to doing a biopsy excision biopsy is always superior to fnac so even though it is fnac is easier procedure we usually do an excision biopsy okay so let's look into this case let's look into this case now a 9 year old kid presented with complaints of constantly escalating pain abdomen diarrhea and vomiting diarrhea and vomiting around 5 episodes were there along with fever since 3 days so this was the history this was the history so what do you think of hopi what other things you would like to ask anything else you would like to ask in hopi so there was no lymph node swelling no superficial lymph node swelling was there okay no superficial lymph node swelling was there next coming to pain abdomen what is the characteristic of pain abdomen was okay first differential diagnosis going by this thing we'll obviously think of acute g acute g is our first differential diagnosis okay very good so but this pain now what was characteristic of this pain was initially the pain was in the periumbilical region initially the pain was in the periumbilical region but then it go went and got localized to right lower lumbar region right lower lumbar region this was the characteristic of the pain this was characteristic of the pain so now anything you would like to think of anything you can yeah very good appendicitis is sir next differential diagnosis being going by the nature of pain even on doing examination even on doing examination for this patient there was pain there was rebound tenderness all these things were present pain rebound tenderness all these things were present localized to the right lower lumbar region okay so anything else you would like to ask in history anything else you would like to ask in history for this patient other than hopi so yeah with this we can think of gangrene obstruction but this is a 9 year old kid so gangrene is unlikely but obstruction yeah obstruction is very much likely to happen toxic features were not there toxic features were not there for living anything else you want to ask in history okay you guys don't want to ask anything in the medical history nothing significant was there bloody diarrhea was not there it was just loose stools so further on, on doing investigations leukocytosis was there on doing cbc on doing usg fluid collection was there in the peritoneum fluid collection was there okay fluid collection was there and mesenteric lymph nodes so this indicates that non superficial lymph nodes also can be enlarged which was detected by a ultrasound mesenteric lymph nodes also were enlarged so what they did to this patient was thinking it could be an appendicitis they went ahead and did surgery okay they went ahead and did surgery they removed the appendix they removed the appendix okay they removed the appendix but again on follow up again on follow up after a month it was noticed that same again there was fluid collection again there was fluid collection again there was mesenteric lymphadenitis lymph, sorry mesenteric lymph nodes were present so sharanya very good so our next differential diagnosis will be 
mesenteric lymphadenitis mesenteric lymphadenitis what could have been the cause that's why i stress so much on history on his diet history revealed so you guys forgot to ask any epidemiological history undercooked meat he was consume he had consumed undercooked meat now could you think yes very good puja shri it was yersinia and on doing elisa for this it turned out to be yersinia enterocolitis yersinia enterocolitis so it causes pseudo appendicitis with mesenteric lymphadenitis okay so that is the diagnosis so finally since we have done everything since we have done the history then we have done examination we knew how to keep differential diagnosis we have the mnemonic for it everything we we'll just see in brief how to approach you guys already know how to approach a case as you have done with the above case scenarios you guys are good at it so just summarizing the whole thing history you ask in terms of this mnemonic cold wrap tape this is a mnemonic then go ahead and do physical examination of the lymph node in terms of extent location size number surface texture consistency mobility tenderness skin over the lymph node and hepatosplenomegaly so this with this you can have a differential diagnosis in the mind a smaller version of the differential diagnosis is myomy this can be the mnemonic it can either be because of malignancy infection any autoimmune or inflammatory etiology miscellaneous or iatrogenic so after this most of the patients we shouldn't jump into a biopsy what in the we just did unnecessary biopsy for a case of reactive lymphadenitis wherein it was not requ required we do biopsy only prompt biopsy is only required when it is suggestive of a malignancy and the features were those red flag symptoms and as mentioned in harrison's those following indications other than that nothing is usually biopsy is not required we just wait and watch so at least and at least half of them require no lab studies also so it's if patient's history and physical examination point to a benign cause what we usually do is we just confront the patient and then tell him that it is usually of a benign etiology and ask him for to come for follow up and wait for a 2 to 4 week interval if it is still not diagnosed then we think of unexplained lymphadenopathy or his history patient's history symptoms and examination if it is suggestive of any diagnosis and if it is of a benign and self limited cause then we go ahead and treat we go ahead and treat okay if it is not treatable if it is any reactive lymphadenitis we just reassure and again wait for around 2 to 4 week time and then still if it is present again it will become unexplained again unexplained lymphadenopathy so if the patient's clinical features history and examination is suggestive of any autoimmune etiology or any serious infection cause then we go ahead and do specific testing auto antibodies we measure we do pcr or elisa and measure antibodies or nucleic acid testing using pcr we do and measure for those specific infectious etiology or specific autoimmune cause if it turns out to be positive again we treat if it turns out to be negative again go to unexplained lymphadenopathy if it is directly suggestive of malignancy as told we'll do prompt biopsy specific testing in terms of excisional biopsy again and usually it is excisional biopsy and not fnsc if it is negative again unexplained if it is positive we'll go ahead and treat so next we'll see how we'll approach an unexplained lymphadenopathy if it is usually miscellaneous cause like we saw kikuchi disease trosai drofman syndrome or a castleman's disease all those things will we will get to know by doing history and physical examination if something is not favoring this then we'll think of any miscellaneous cause in that case also we'll go ahead further and do biopsy to look into it or we are thinking of malignancy when there is high risk factor for malignancy we again go ahead and do excisional biopsy if both the things are not there and it indicates that it is a lower risk it is of lower risk then we'll see whether it is generalized or regional okay if it is regional we again observe the patient for a month if it resolves well and good if it doesn't resolve we go ahead and do higher investigations if it is generalized we do certain basic workup 
if it is still negative we go ahead and do a biopsy if it is positive biopsy turns out to be positive for any disease we treat appropriately this biopsy again on doing biopsy we find that it is a metastatic nephrod and we don't know the primary foci then we'll go ahead and do higher investigations like ct mri pet ct and on we do in that case we'll do pct mri pet ct all those things okay if biopsy as well as is negative again we'll try for follow up follow up for persisting or any changing lymphadenopathy then on doing follow up if still it turns out to be present and if it is not resolved again we'll repeat all this investigation all these investigations we will repeat okay so that any changes would have occurred so one very important thing is do not treat the patient empirically with it's a habit to treat with antibiotics and steroids but antibiotics is okay but do not treat the patient empirically with steroids because on doing a biopsy it causes changes since it has lympholytic effect we will not be able to diagnose what the disease is or if there is any underlying infectious etiology the infection can flare up only in case of emergency like if there is laryngeal or pharyngeal obstruction because of lymphadenopathy we can go ahead and give glucocorticoids or else no please don't give glucocorticoids so with all these things in mind even with approach can we do this one last case one last case and then we'll find up okay a 45 year old gentleman presents with multiple left sided anterior neck swelling so this is the last case anything you think of in hopi yes very good duration this the patient noticed a month back one month back since then it is increasing in size increasing in size okay and many other lymph nodes also got involved initially it was just one prominent lymph node now there are around four to five such lymph nodes four to five such lymph nodes so this is about duration and progression next what you last okay you wait are me shravan directly jump to personal history and exposure history yes there is history of using tobacco there is history of chewing tobacco okay then comes associated features associated features there was no history of fever no fever was present fever was not present what else you guys would like to ask your pneumonic is here okay weight loss weight loss was present weight loss was present he has lost around 3 kg in the past one month okay differential diagnosis since it's a so cervical lymphadenopathy and older age we will think of malignancy okay and someone earlier told that it is a ca larynx okay dysphagia breathing difficulty were not present so non hodgkins lymphoma is next ulcer in the mouth no there was no ulcer in the mouth hoarseness of voice no no hoarseness of voice again to rule out localizing malignancy very good there was no hoarseness of voice also as well so all the associated features were not there family history nothing significant past history also nothing significant personal history there was history of chewing tobacco difficulty swallowing also not there on examination on examination what we found was it was a hard fixed lymph node hard fixed lymph node and since two to three other swellings also came up it became later it became matted later it became matted okay rishab went to oral hygiene good oral hygiene was good oral hygiene okay since he was consuming lot of tobacco it was not that oral hygiene was poor oral hygiene was poor in this patient but still all the red flag symptoms are still present 
ओके वाइट आर मी श्रवण वाई यू आर आस्किंग फॉर यूनिलैटरल हियरिंग लॉस यूनिलैटरल हियरिंग लॉस इन दिस केस इट वाज नॉट प्रेजेंट ओके यूनिलैटरल हियरिंग लॉस वाज नॉट प्रेजेंट इन दिस केस ओके टू रूल आउट सीरियस ओटाइटिस मीडिया ट्यूबुलर कार्सिनोमा ओके बट इन दिस केस यूनिलैटरल हियरिंग लॉस एज़ वेल वाज नॉट प्रेजेंट सो एनीथिंग एल्स वुड यू लाइक टू गो अहेड एंड डू सम इन्वेस्टिगेशन ओके differential diagnosis of tbo kept so infectious etiology and some malignant etiology this malignancy localizing to head and neck we can think of at the end of yeah secondary to metastasis because of the nature of lymph node secondary to metastasis of head and neck malignancy we are having it systemic examination nothing else was significant only this much was there only this much was there bowel and bladder symptoms no okay usg rishab asked for usg on doing investigations usg revealed hypoechoic sharp border along with long uh, circular size shape being circular in nature so all these things pointed towards what there was no thyroid or parathyroid involvement all these things suggesting a malignant history so now everything is pointing towards a malignant lymph node so next thing is we'll have to localize we'll have to localize everything is pointing towards metastasis so this is a challenging case this is a very challenging case because there is no other systemic signs no other symptoms only thing is of that of a metastatic lymph node which is malignant in nature so we we'll have to localize how do we localize if we have to localize what do we do what is the next investigation we can do excision biopsy there were infiltration of tumor tumor cells infiltration of tumor cells were there that's all excision biopsy okay pet ct is very costly pet ct you are telling pet ct is very costly patient is not that affordable so then what do you do pet ct is confirmatory it is very good but if the patient is not affordable no no not we can go for an mri no we can always go for an mri since head and neck since there is most more amount of soft tissue we can go to mri mri revealed the nasopharyngeal mass was present nasopharyngeal mass was present in the mri now what is your diagnosis final diagnosis if mri revealed a nasopharyngeal mass yes nasopharyngeal carcinoma only positive history over here was history of tobacco use and this nasopharyngeal carcinoma also is very notorious we can have trotter's triad we can have other clinical features but often it can present with just an isolated neck lymphadenopathy so that is why lymphadenopathy is significant is very important for us to know in detail about it but do not think of malignancy always think of benign causes and then malignancy only if red flag signs symptoms are present like old age hard lymph node increasing in size only then think of malignant etiology okay so that was to do with today's case so what we have done is we have finished full palate ictus cyanosis clubbing lymphadenopathy and edema clubbing what we have done is we have not done case challenge series but through syndrome of the week we have covered clubbing over there also multiple case scenarios were present you can today we'll again share it we'll again share the clubbing video also along with this video in our whatsapp groups and we'll send notes of clubbing also so yeah most important part in our for our exam is palate ictus cyanosis clubbing lymphadenopathy and edema so all these things we have dealt in our classes so please make use of the videos so if any doubts you can ask or you can ask to my number also this is my number you can ask over here as well so any doubts or can we end the session hope it was useful yeah
Ďakujem veľmi pekne.